I already gave you the signal like five minutes ago. D did you? Yeah. Okay, I have no recollection. Oh, I, I see. I see how it is. Um, <laughs> uh, all I, I was just taken aback by this uh, magnificent portrait that someone did of me. Uh, welcome, everyone, again, to Read Write Podcast, the most professional book we... club on in the internet. We're actually pretty professional. Uh, you can you can tell. Uh, all, right, all right, I'll turn it off. That's the, what? No, that's the picture of me. I was talking about that fantastic drawing behind the live image of me. Oh, <laughs> that one. Yeah, no, that yeah. one's hidden. It's not safe for work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, oh shit. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about the second half, or well, I will be talking about the second half of Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yeah. Definitely not, and the art of motorcycle racing, even though I want to call it that every time. No actual racing in this, though. No, not even one time. No, that's not true. There is one reference to motorcycle racing. <laughs> uh, at the Near the end, when they're at a diner, Chris reads motorcycle racing scores. Oh, okay. That's the only reference. All right. Weird. Um, yeah, so... We had a bit of a dilemma this time because we had yeah. it was pretty hard going through the first half for sure. Yeah, and the second half was really way more difficult. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, so I guess I guess we'll start off with my shameful admission. Um, I honestly Shame. couldn't even read the second half. I I didn't get through it. Uh, yeah. It was too hard. I, I tried to read it like six times and I barely got like five pages each time and it was just bloody murder trying to force myself to read it. Oh, and I mean like honestly, even though I will say I finished it, I finished it today, which is usually pretty late for me and yeah. like it was a lot of work to read. I definitely spent like an easy half hour just reading through one page at a time. Yeah. Like, like it was you gotta like half of it just seems like internally contradictory and then you gotta go back and try and figure out did he mean it to be like that or like does he just have no idea what he's talking about or did i completely misunderstand it <laughs> did i read uh, the last I, chapter i did not well i did not no, read you, it i think she probably means the the very very last chapter which i did get you to read oh the afterword i did read the yeah. afterword yeah, uh, and so I guess last things first, uh, Rip and Pizza Chris, the yeah. son of uh, Persig, uh, he was murdered in, what did they say? Yeah, he was... 80, 79, something like that? 79, yeah. Uh, he, um, he was mugged, basically. Yeah, it was just kind of a shitty, shitty mugging. Yeah, um, yeah so there is a pretty downbeat at the very like even beyond the end because even the end of it is not uh, the most positive conclusion really uh and then you go to the afterwards and it's like oh by the way not only did i am i estranged from my son but i like he got killed yeah yeah but and i also i did get a sense of, of um like change there was he definitely seemed to have a different perspective in the afterward than in the main book given it was written 10 years later i want yeah i definitely i definitely see that um i thought his perspective about his kids were weird it was a little weird but yeah it, uh, he definitely said that he like just straight up replaced his kid and it was fine that way yeah a little weird yeah a little weird I mean, like, it's not, it's, it's, it's not exactly like you were saying, like, I replaced it, but it's like, sort of like a reincarnation thing. Like, yeah, uh, and that's not really that far out of character, given his uh, Buddhist and yeah, Zen that, kind of thing. That's very fair. Um, I did think the, the, like, second last line there was adorable. That was, yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> I feel like that's there to foil someone who flips to the last page and reads the last line. And it's just straight gibberish. 
I'm surprised the editors let it in, left it in. Um, this is a pretty famous book. Yeah. So even if it wasn't there in the first edition, you know, that's that's something that's going to be there forever in yeah. all the other versions. So when was the afterword written? I don't know. I didn't look, even look at that, to be fair. Does it say? Because the book had been released long before oh, no. the afterword. It says 19... Yeah, actually, it says right at the very end, it says Robert Persig, Gothenburg, Sweden, where he was living in a houseboat at the time in 1984. Right. So yeah, 10 years after the book was, was published. Okay. And this guy liked to move around a lot. Like, like he lived yeah. in the United States, and he lived in the UK, and then he lived in Sweden, and then he lived in... He moved somewhere else. I want to say like France for somewhere. Maybe I'm confusing him with our next book author. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like he's he lived in a bunch of different parts of the states. Like uh, oh yeah, in India and, and like uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, he's he's all, been all over the place. He was in Korea for a while during the war. Mm -hmm. Like so yeah. Um, so I don't know uh, exactly. How, how do you want to go about this? So, I think for a book of this type, spoilers don't really matter. Yeah, I agree. Because uh, I don't think the end is fundamentally all that much different from the beginning. No, and I mean, yeah, spoiler alert, he drives to California on a motorcycle. Cool. Right, right? <laughs> like, like, we kind of knew he was going to do that. I guess the only possibility was that he'd quit partway through, which he kind of threatens to do at two points or maybe only one yeah um so yeah not that surprising yeah so so that's not that big a surprise but it's like the the journey through him going through his own history and and allegedly like trying to remember it or at least trying to like justify his behavior to himself or at least trying to figure out why he did these things um yeah because he's he's trying to figure out uh He's trying to figure out what, what. He's well, trying to piece together things. all these fractions of himself that he has from before the, before the uh, shock treatment, shock therapy. Yeah, which he points out in the afterwards would be illegal, like almost any period in time after it happened to him when they forced him to take that shock therapy. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty messed up, you know, given what it does to people's memories and stuff like that. Yeah, no kidding. Um, but I mean, like, in terms of the the philosophy element that he that he's kind of forwarding, I guess my biggest problem with this part was he makes one main argument that al almost all of it is founded on, and I did not accept that argument. Yeah. And so it meant that like he's building this whole thing very methodically, but I don't I don't believe the premise. Or the foundation of it so all the rest of it is just like okay well you got another layer of bullshit on top of the bullshit on top of the other bullshit yeah uh i definitely agree i thought uh sort of his idea of quality uh i only got the beginnings of it obviously because i didn't get very far um also your beer is nice uh yes thank you uh fallen clown all <laughs> clowns i have determined appreciate my beard fallen or otherwise <laughs> Uh, so sorry, that was a sidetrack. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, oh, quality. The, yeah, the quality, right. the universality, or like the 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 argument yeah. that it it precedes subjectivity and objectivity. I <clears throat> I don't really understand what that is supposed to mean. Uh, yeah, like my fundamental problem with this book is that he's he. He's building this hierarchy. Well, but he says, but then he goes and says that he's not doing that. Oh, Re remember? Okay. Okay, but but no, <laughs> I know he totally says that to begin with. Yeah. Well, so so he's building a hierarchy, and he's putting people into these cat like people and things into these categories that he's created in this hierarchy. And I just I don't fundamentally buy the distinctions he makes between them. Yeah. So so I took some notes specifically on these uh, dichotomies that he creates. Uh, the science and art split. Yeah. That one is um, one of the most ridiculous, in my opinion. 
Though I think at the time it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Oh man! So there's some shade being thrown at your beard. <laughs> it it but, is quite messy. This is uh, this is Brendan's channel. We can't throw too much beard shade. <laughs> no, I need to I need to do some trimming and get get it nice again. Much like this book. Much like this much, book. Much could be trimmed, and a lot of more additional order could be brought to it. Um, there so yeah. are a lot of scenes that I think are unnecessary in this book. Yeah, and I mean, as much as it's kind of a travel log, so like you know, stuff just happens, and he's describing it as it happens. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of seemingly, and in a part that you didn't get to, but there's a lot of very seemingly vindictive parts against yeah. people at the university he worked in. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know, man. So, it, and he he gets like really personal. Like, how personal are we talking? Not not like insulting their family, but like putting words in their in professors' mouths and uh, describing their behavior in a way that kind of presumes he can read their mind. And you know, I so mean, is is that really that surprising considering how much ego he's shown up to this point? No, not surprising. It's just. Um, I don't know. It's amazingly hypocritical given all of his condemnation of like egoizing that he goes on. But isn't this entire book literally egoizing? Uh, well, it's him trying to justify his egoizing as not egoizing because it's it's universal, right? Because quality, the quality that only he can see, is a universal quality that is the same for everyone unless you see it differently. I guess. <clears throat> Garrett Robertson. Robinson. Yeah, uh, Garrett Robinson is a streamer on Twitch who goes under the name Vlogga Novel. Uh, he's oh. an Amazon bestseller. Oh, dang. Uh, in the fantasy category. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, so you talking about the somehow quality comes before everything, um, which is really interesting because. Uh, towards the end he talks about or when he's in one of his university classes talking to this antagonistic professor uh, the professor claims that uh, the thing that he's arguing which is the dialectic form of rhetoric comes before ev everything and uh, of course Phaedrus is deeply offended by this like oh nothing can come before everything except for the thing that I think Oh there. my god, yeah. It's it's like he just straight up contradicts himself. It's really kind of insulting to the reader if you're paying attention. I don't know. I feel like I'm missing some integral part because this is a very well regarded book. Yeah. And yet it seems totally ludicrous. I'm gonna say something that might come across as offensive, but I don't mean it to be offensive. Um But do you think we're too smart for this book? <laughs> Man. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we're too far in the future from when this book was published. Yeah. And, like, the problems have changed so much. Yeah. Like, that's the other aspect I was going on with this. Because, like, and, and when I say by too smart, I mean, like, like we have studied philosophy. Well, and I think I think the other side of this is maybe that, but also, um, like, we have the benefit of 2020 hindsight yeah. on 40, 40 years of that man's future that he's trying to project it to that's fair so yeah like sure it seems like we're smart but it's only because we've seen his future and we know that he was wrong in certain aspects yeah um yeah i i definitely agree with that because i think it's one of those things where you know the way technology has developed it's kind of become a part of every aspect of human culture so right. trying to divorce Di diverge technology from any activity is almost impossible well and i think it's it's only because that's more like immediately present in our day-to-day -day lives that we think that even though it's kind of always been the same yeah because like even from the first person who decided to write something down instead of just say it to someone else you know, yeah like, i i mean the written the written word is a technology of sorts yeah so and like the further back you go 
the more you have people complaining about the new technology. So, like, even in his Platonic and Aristotelian era that he gets into in the second half, uh, you know, there were people complaining about the Platonic dialogues that, you know, you sh that argument should only be made in person in spoken words and you should never write it down because it diminishes it. And then, like, you know, a few thousand years after that, you had people complaining that the printing press was messing up handwritten stuff, and like, you know, it was completely ruining everything, and all these darn printing press hipsters were were making the world awful. Uh, is that is that like kind of like ten years ago where everyone was like, "Ebooks are ruining books." Exactly, it's exactly the same thing. It's every yeah. new technological generation just pushes uh, someone to the margins, and yeah. so then they've got to push back. Yeah, I'm um, I'm in the middle right now of an interesting just well not right the second but in general uh, with a bunch of other comics professionals who uh, are talking about sort of comics in the digital age. Like, what's the next step for comic books? Like, it's not going to be Diamond Distributors Limited distributing it to uh, your local comic book shop. No, no, that's going away. That's yeah, and some might even say largely already gone away. Uh, it's definitely a huge transition uh, right now. Uh, I think to a certain extent, uh, digital comics are not that popular in comics. Really, it seems like so much more sensible. It, it oh no no there there is nobody who disagrees that it's more sensible, but whether or not that's replacing what came before is yeah yeah. There's definitely um, and there's a sense of um, of desire to have the physical object i feel like that's cultivated by the comic book industry like there's a materialist component to it yeah i would love uh, love comics to get directly uploaded to my brain meat that would save me so much time <laughs> oh yeah that exactly or books or, or whatever just yeah jack it straight in right into the spine i'm fine yep just give me the neo treatment i'm totally down um so that that is totally a thing um the interesting thing about it is is kind of i think a lot so the interesting thing about the comics argument is that uh a lot of the people that i've been talking to have been saying kind of the same thing about like the big two publishers and all that that we're kind of saying about persig in this where you know he's they're kind of on a cusp and they've been doing the same thing for so long that they don't really know how to get out of that funk and get into the new thing that people actually care about. And I feel like Persig in a lot of ways is, is right on that cusp, right? Of that cultural change, as he talks about in the afterward, where technology is going to become more important. Those divides are going to get smaller in everyone, in people's day to day very, very soon. Like by uh, yeah. eighty five, I'm sure it's an entirely different thing. Yeah, yeah. The the pace of change in uh, computation and uh, networking technology certainly right is like accelerating, like and is still accelerating exponentially. Right. So, uh, so in, in kind of the same way, like we we were talking about, like you know, Marvel DC not adapting to to change because they've been on top for so long, and they're like big giant corporations who just think people want what's kind of selling well right now well and they don't want to take the risk right because there's yeah. like billions of dollars at stake yep um and i actually think that kind of plays into one of the things that persig says uh, which is about well it their thinking anyway is similar to his in as much as you either get it or you don't and you can't be the thing can't be explained to you yeah so like there will come a point where just the, the the balance is going to shift and push them over the the brink whereas because persig well he's not maybe making that argument particular like the economic argument but he's making the intellectual argument that like if you don't understand the thing then you simply can't even begin to approach it yeah uh, which is kind of bullshit from an intellectual perspective from a business perspective i can get it because they're kind of intentionally self-blinding yeah yeah, yeah, I I agree with you because I, I I like I guess the argument is is that if 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 you didn't understand it, you could never use it. But I guess in a certain oh, I just realized something. 
I was going to make a, a totally different argument, but uh, I actually realize now that several conversations we've had are very similar to Persix, in which, um, for those of you who don't know, me and Sam have spent a great deal of time selling computers to people who have no idea how computers work. Yeah. And in that scenario, we're Persig, and the consumer is, uh, what's his face? With John. So yeah, John. Oh, yeah, I've had this conversation for sure. Like, even with people buying the community, it's like, you know, this is not a new thing that you're, like, intimidated by this technology. Like, 40 years ago, the people before you, you know, you accepted some new technology, and they were, like, blown away that you had any idea how to use it. And yeah. they never buy it. They never buy it. Not a single time do they accept that argument. <laughs> yeah, but, like, in a certain sense, like, neither does John, right? Like, he never accepts that argument either. No, exactly. He says that he's doing things the way that they've always been done, and that makes sense. Just like everyone seems to say. Yeah. So I was actually going to, for a second there, argue kind of the opposite in that uh, we're like we're kind of able to approach technology even though we don't understand how it works because like we use cell phones every day but we don't know how to build a cell phone specifically yeah well to be fair almost nobody ha knows how to make the really complicated parts in a cell phone like those are not human manufacturable yeah you can't a human being cannot put together a microprocessor it's not possible so we're actually at a stage in like way past where Persig was, but we're, we are now at a stage where technology is actually not something that I could just, if I really learned how, put together. Yeah. You know, like I could assemble a motorcycle theoretically, and yes, things are at high tolerances, but you know, it's forgiving enough technology that you can you can just hammer and chisel it. But nowadays, you cannot do that. You actually yeah. you are so many levels of industrial design away from being able to construct this that normal individuals or really any humans don't have access to it because i've literally seen my cousin shane build a motorcycle yeah like from scrap <laughs> like well, building building his own frame building yeah anyway he's a as he talks about he's a mechanic book, yeah you can <laughs> fundamentally the motorcycle is just bits of shaped metal right and so if you can weld or you can wield a, a hammer that's heavy enough you can bend and shape and flex that metal into whatever form you want. Yep. Um, so what did you think, even in the part that you read, mm -hmm. getting back to the book a little bit more, about his um, refusal to define quality? Like, how can you form an argument without defining the central thing for which you are arguing? <sighs> On the one hand, it really pisses me off. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, I kind of get it. And here's why. Like, I, I get it because I don't think quality is definable. And as soon as you define it as something, you're automatically wrong. Why? Why? Well, because well, if, if I'm not correct in defining it, then that means that there is a definition to which I'm not yet adhering right you're right, right. that so, is a logical weirdness isn't it <laughs> that's that's a, a classic property is theft problem yeah you can't have, right well no yeah but like that's the kind of vibe i get from from what he's saying it is like he's like as soon as i define this i'm i'm wrong i've got to find the correct definition and he never has found the correct definition so he doesn't define it well and it, he makes a, a strong argument that he should not define it because by defining it it somehow becomes like less true because he makes a lot of um comparisons to well excuse me uh zen buddhism mm -hmm. which you know big surprise it's in the yeah. title <laughs> uh, um about some of the the i don't know what they are prayers basically about the buddha uh like the um uh i, I know what you're talking about yeah, so there's a, there's a and, term for those specifically. Yeah, and he he uses the right word in the book. Um, but like how the the Buddha is, you can't define the Buddha. He's everywhere, but he's nowhere. 
and he's kind of making Persig's making that argument here about quality he's, and he explicitly says like you just take one of those little verses and replace the word buddha with quality and you know what i'm saying what that's what he says he's like uh. it, it mm, yeah well yeah i don't want to get too pedantic on like observer uh, effect there pinkalicious <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm sure Persig was not going for that either. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, a lot of his argument has to do with... I feel like it's very much founded in that sort of Aristotelian view of... Uh, there's, like, a perfect shape. And I know he got into it at the beginning of the book a little bit more, but I feel like his entire kind of philosophy is is kind of in that idea of how he, the reason why he doesn't define quality is because quality is this ideal that can never exist. Well, he yeah, he says that it's like a universal absolute that yeah. humans are, are only like partially privy to. We only have it somewhat revealed to us. Yeah. Um, and I was having a conversation with someone uh, at work and uh, they had an interesting opinion that this is all they said it all seemed like sublimated theology yeah uh, like like he was worshipping this idea and therefore he didn't want to define it because how do you define your god yeah I know that's who you were talking to <laughs> that's totally what he's doing though yeah he is 100% well yeah, I mean he literally I was just reading the part where he called it the church of reason right yeah so like he he simultaneously bashes on um on like things being irrational sort of but then at the same time he brings it brings that into his own philosophy and insists that that's really the only acceptable way to view things yeah yeah it's a, it's a real his argument i felt like was a real big mess i agree um and, and to be honest, the only parts I really enjoyed were the parts that were like side notes in in his philosophical thinking. So like like I was saying to you earlier in te- when I was texting you, saying, you know, I really enjoyed the parts where he talks about art, um, especially when he was started talking about technology as art, when he was describing like mm-hmm. making that rotisserie and how that was kind of like it's sculpting, but it's really far removed from sculpting. But it, totally. it, like it's the same process. Right. And I was like, oh. That's so true. And yeah, there's actually an incident it close, very close to the end of the book uh, where um, something happens to the motorcycle and the chain guard gets torn, like gets uh, caught by the chain and gets totally ripped up. Like a big hole gets ripped in it. Yeah. But it's too thin of metal to like, what, or the author thinks it's too thin metal to weld properly. So he doesn't know what he's going to do. So he goes to this welding shop with it uh, and he finds the guy who runs it, and the guy's like, uh, okay, well, I can probably fix that, but it's all dirty, so you got to clean it off. And he goes through this whole elaborate... It's one of these scenes that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. He goes through the elaborate process of, like, he describes him washing it and then, like, taking it back, and the guy's like, no, not good enough. And he goes, he's got to, like, put solvent on it and bring it back. And So, anyway, at the end of it, the, the welder um, does this amazing trick with the flux and the the welding torch where you know under normal circumstances if you weren't an expert welder you'd burn a hole through this thing because the metal's so thin but he manages to just basically without touching it repair this hole seamlessly Uh, i mean like i as someone who has tried welding it is extremely difficult (laughs) yeah and b uh people who do it all the time are really good at it yeah and and that's (laughs) that's what he's talking about here and then he like he praises the the mechanic or the the welder but doesn't he hate welder. mechanics yeah i know sometimes not all the time but only but only like he hates them unless they're useful to him well he hates them unless they have the wrong attitude or the attitude he doesn't have because he also he does one of his divide like there's two kinds of welders there's the kind that i am and what? everyone else <laughs> right he does that all the time though right he's oh. always splitting things into the, the what what is i agree with what is his fascination with binaries it's easy. Yeah. I don't know if that's really what it is, but I think Stitzel is correct though. I think that point about uh when he discusses the main system of the mo- motorcycle of being the holy trinity, that's a very valid point. He does. <laughs> I and I was just flipping through the book and I saw that page 
where he shows the the flow chart. Oh yeah. <laughs> His flow chart of like, oh, this is an un, an unreasonable way to define a motorcycle, except that it's incredibly... except there's like ten pages of him describing the motorcycle and defining the motorcycle that way. Yeah. It. I don't know, man. This guy. But this isn't a good way to do it. I actually thought it was an extremely good way to do it because it defined it very well for me. Yeah, and then he argues that like there's that. He's like, well, you can also define it by their function. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's totally valid. Yeah, here it is. The. Where is it? It's this right here. Yeah. So what? Uh, read those three categories off. It's on top. You have motorcycle, obviously, the whole thing. And then it's subdivided into components and functions. And then below components, you have the power assembly and the running assembly. Because he goes into this. You know all all the parts that do the different things. Okay, so if we say that the motorcycle is God, then yeah. one of those is the Holy Spirit and one of those is Jesus Christ. The components is Jesus and the function is the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then For what sure. were the other two? And then below components, i.e., people or Jesus, yeah. you have your power assembly and your running assembly. So uh, the body what... and the spirit again. Yeah. I was going to make a, a, a more functional joke. Well, not joke, but comparison between, like, the church and the congregation. But, yeah, no, that's equally valid. He's way into... Like, even though repeatedly he rejects dualisms, he's way into it. And, yeah, I, people, I mean, I like let's, let's I be don't. honest, though. Like, he rejects literally everything he agrees with. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, I know. It's yeah. kind of hard to make a coherent argument against him because then they, like, because he, cause he instantly arguments. argues himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's that. So I really, yeah. So I really like the parts about art. I thought his perspective on art was really interesting, uh, because his perspective on art wasn't nearly as divided as he wanted it to be. I think, or maybe I just, yeah. maybe just in my future, in my future self, I, I have identified them together in a way that he didn't intend. So there's that. And then I really like the parts about education. Um, specifically the parts where he talks about uh, gradeless classes. That's the part I kind of left off at when he was discussing it now where he was talking about, you know, like what students do well when there's no grades right? and yeah. like all that we, stuff. But like he yeah, had the yeah. empirical evidence of actually having a class and done it through a class. And I was fascinated by yeah. it. Yeah, it was, um, and he he, re he goes back and he touches on that again later yeah. at the the very end. But why yeah, does he the, keep come bringing that back up? Uh, because well, because of the problems he has in university, I think uh, because he would have benefited tremendously from that. Fair enough. Uh, Be because he, like I don't feel like it's a part of his main arguments. Oh, well, his argument there, I thought, was that. Um, the people who are least concerned with the with imitating what the university wants are most in touch with this universal quality factor and therefore are innately better equipped to produce anything yeah uh yeah and if you're if you're 16 and you haven't read zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance um you're not missing anything yeah there, there, there are a lot of books that are better than this not gonna lie yeah so uh i don't know what like what else i really want to say about that great thing i was fascinated by the breakdown uh i thought that the way that he was like so this is what this is the percentages of people who said what and then here's the percentages of people who got different grades who said like what they said I thought that was a really good way to break it down. Though I will note that in that part he says, based uh, that he, the grades he gave them were very similar to the grades that he predicted, and like all this other stuff that sounded super arrogant and like uh, judgmental of like, oh yeah, this one student gets A's in all of his other classes. So obviously, when they got an A in my class, that was correct. Mm -hmm. It's well, like, and but that's not really how courses work. Also, he's he's <laughs> uh, analyzing results from a course he's scoring himself. Yeah, 
It was completely illegitimate. Like, you can't be partial about that, although his claim would be that partiality doesn't matter because this is an absolute value and that he's somehow in touch with. Yeah. Right? So, like, I don't... I it, He both intentionally and unintentionally defies analysis. <laughs> yeah, don't feel bad about not finishing the book, Pink. It, it has been a trudge. And, hell, I appreciate that you even tried. Yeah. I, I don't know how many other people have been reading along, along with us, but, you know, it's great that you did. Yeah. Because I, like, yeah, I got halfway through the book. I'm literally, like, four pages from the pink stick, from the sticky that you put in it. <laughs> like, that's where I'm at. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> at least you know that you got halfway. Uh, I'm probably going to try and finish it eventually, because I think I should. Yeah, it, more more from an aspect of I want to learn more about his prose than I want to learn more about what he thinks. Yeah, well, and that's kind of one of the saddest parts of the whole thing is it's super well written. Yeah, like I just I just don't buy it. I've been talking about this book for like three days about how I was how I was trying to get through it, and it's just like I feel so terrible because it's such a pleasant experience to read this book but it's so freaking boring that i i just i i can't i can't do it <laughs> i tried so yeah. hard like you have no idea like i pick it up i'd read a paragraph i'd read paragraph that same paragraph again i read a third time and I'd just be like no nah, i'm out <laughs> well i have like whole chunks of notes that are just like what the hell is this guy's problem what what is this shit you know what what, what am i even reading just literally that that's a uh, yeah. Sissel brings up a good point. I should just I should just audiobook the rest. Yeah, that's probably not a bad idea. And plus, the prose is very nice. So I think if you got an unabridged audiobook version that was kind of just that flow, like had a good flow to it, like that, I think it would work really really well. Yeah, it would depend on like who's reading it. But you know that always depends. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I, I, well, like I think his prose is really good. Like I'm a big fan of his prose. And, it's very and, simple. Yeah, and part of the reason why I felt so bad was because the prose was so good. Like I felt worse because the prose was good than if the prose was bad and I couldn't get through it. You know. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Like yeah, it's putting down a a good or well a book that kind of promises to be good. Yeah. And, and like, and to be honest, I think that if the pros had been worse, I would have gotten even less far as I did. Like, I wouldn't have made it as far as I did. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. I, I also feel like it would have been shorter if the pros were not <laughs> good. Like, it would have just been someone would edit it way down. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that probably should have been cut that wasn't. Well, he makes a bunch of. Like, there's a bunch of things in here that are just wrong like he makes a bunch of historical assertions about like the way things changed about uh, the renaissance in the first part he says like oh the renaissance was uh, or people started thinking differently because they discovered the new world and you know it shook up their whole belief system totally not true that's not what happened the friggin eastern roman empire got knocked down and everyone who lived there moved to the west <laughs> not everyone but like a ton of them and so all of a sudden you had all these like basically university professors from the Roman Empire yeah. moving into Paris and London and Rome. Uh, and, you know, they had a pretty different perspective on things. And so it, that's what shook it up. Mostly people didn't even know there was an, a new world at that point. Yeah. It wouldn't be for 100 years be until the normal people would know that. And so yeah. like, that's I think totally bullshit. I think the argumental point of that example was good. But I agree with you that the... Well, it's great to have a good point, but if it's just based on something that's made up, then, like, it doesn't yeah. mean anything. Because that was when he was talking about Christopher Columbus, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's not what happened. Yeah. Christopher Columbus came and enslaved everyone in Hispaniola, and they all died. That's what happened. Yeah. Right? Like, he didn't go here to go to North America so he could, like, discover new ideas. He came here because he wanted gold. Yeah. So, I don't know. It... I, I, it's just to find something like that, that kind of loose corner at his, at the validity of everything that he says, just makes me want to keep pulling it up and seeing how far you're uh, you're unraveling that yarn sweater. 
Yeah, I'm like, like there's, there's, the stitches. <laughs> there's too many loose strings for me to pull at that I can see are there to not wonder how much of the rest of it is just barely woven together. Yeah. Um, I find that uh, that's an interesting statement, uh, Sitzville, uh, that like maybe you aren't ready for this for this book at this point in your life. And you could be extremely correct. I would like to, I, if you wouldn't mind, if you could expand on that for me, uh, I'd be really interested to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, and li- like, I guess, I guess I'm saying like, like at, at what point in life would be good or like maybe break that down that argument a little bit. Are, are you, are cause you I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> I definitely don't think you're wrong. I think you're probably correct, but um, I'm intrigued. Do you feel that you're ready to give really bad parenting advice? Because that's what Persig does. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering I don't have a kid and I've given some really good parenting advice in my life so far, uh, no. Oh, okay. Maybe? Persig, because definitely at the end when he's talking to his son, like they're just north of San Francisco, he basically, like, Persig's having a total breakdown. And, yeah. Uh, and his kid knows it. And he tells Chris that, like, Yo, everyone thinks you're crazy. Did you know that they think you're crazy? <laughs> and it's like the most fucked up thing to His say. His kid is really damn. smart. Right, yeah, but like, damn, man, that's that's fucked up to say to a young child like that, to say like, by the way, everyone thinks you're a weirdo. To a child who's already socially socially alienated enough. From, like, Do you think the out. child is partially socially alienated because of that perception? Maybe, I I don't know, man. Or is That's it because of his own mental illness? Because we've determined that he wa- he did have a mental illness, right? Well, or Persig thinks he did. Well, someone thought he did. Right. Um, Do you man. hear that noise? Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, age isn't the factor for this time in your life. I think experience is the thing. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I wasn't really asking about like what age I need to be to read this. I was thinking about like in what life stage would you I don't know if you could even recommend a life stage or something. I'm just kind of wondering of like if this isn't the right time, when would be the right time for me? Is there a way that I can see that? Have you arrived at the point where you see everyone is flawed? I'm like way past that point. That was like my university experience where I realized how flawed I was and I had to learn to deal with it. And then I like kind of figured all that other stuff out. Um, But I'm kind of back at a point where like, I don't care that everyone is flawed because I'm going to use those flaws to make cool art. I don't know. Does that make sense? Is that weird? I don't know if that basically makes sense to me. Okay. Like, not to call it out too much. Is this Twitch? <laughs> Is this Twitch doing this to us? Are we haunted by the ghost of Twitch? What do you mean? You don't hear that noise? No. Oh, man. I got a real bad feedback noise. Like, like a lot of weird crackling. Hold on. Let me try something. Hold on to your butt, stream. All right. Just helps you to accept his character. Oh, I see what you mean. Like, if... if well, okay. Is the argument you're making, Cecil, that if if I was jaded about, about people in the world, I would get it better? Like, it'd be easier for me to read? But because I'm not that jaded, it, it doesn't? Because if so, I'm kind of okay with that. Pass jaded. Your mic is off, Sam. I got nothing. Oh, so uh, for those listening to the audio version of this later, uh, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties here. 
Uh, so uh, Sam's going to work on that, and I'm just going to keep uh, talking about some of the stuff in the chat. Just keep, just keep going until I, I say I hear you, Sam. Um, have you tried being more jaded while, while reading this? Um, I, I kind of wanted to because you kind of want to get into that philosophical mindset of why is he jaded? But at the end of the day, I couldn't really separate myself. Like I couldn't separate myself and the way that I view myself from that, uh, from that dichotomy, like from from his philosophical argument and i think that shows in the what i really liked about this book and that like i really picked up on the art and i really picked up on the stuff that kind of resonated with me like education and all that stuff because i'm a firm believer in education i'm also a firm believer that uh there are a lot of students particularly myself who um not to say that I had a bad school experience or anything, but I, I kind of feel like the system is designed for the majority and I am not one of them. So in a certain sense, it, it failed me. Um, so there is that. Uh, so when, when he started talking about gradeless classes and all that, I really it really resonated with me, especially because he was talking about uh, the original argument being that uh, when there's no grades, the student kind of stops trying uh, and they're given freedom. And when they're given freedom, they slack and all that stuff. And, and really that's what happened to me in university is I had all this freedom and I didn't do the things that school wanted me to be. I did the things that I wanted to do to help myself learn. And, and those weren't the same things. Okay. There's Jada and then there's a period past that. I think you are past Jaded. Is that a good thing? I, I, I'm assuming that's a good thing. That like, I've, I've, I've gotten the right experiences to move this. Yeah, and and that and that's exactly what I'm what I'm kind of uh, talking about. Pink is that I I don't see his point of view because I, I I'm unable to step away from my sense of self in philosophy because my philosophical ideals are from a whole different place than his philosophical ideas, especially because I am a person who. Uh, is like I'm, I'm kind of the very thing that he argues uh, against existing I am a technological artist I write and I design technological experiences right like I, this, these are things that I do I work in comics with digital artists like and we do different things in digital art than we do in traditional art but I'm working right now with with one one digital artist, one traditional artist, and one digital and traditional artist. So like someone who does uh, their pencils and roughs in digital and then inks traditionally and all that kind of stuff, right? So there's there's an element of of like I, I, I see all these types and I interact with all of them and they're all different and, and I see the, the beauty in their differences. Um, and, and yeah, I, I definitely have survived some hard times. Um, I had a lot of depression issues when I was in university. Uh, mostly due to that freedom because I had all this freedom and I stopped doing good at school. And the worse that I did at school, the more that I trapped myself in my room and uh, did more things that were considered slacking and and all that. But, I mean, like, I literally right now, I... Today alone, I have spent six hours with comic book professionals learning more about my craft, learning and pushing myself to finding the experiences, finding the resources to, to like learn things that are important to me. Like those A students that he was talking, that Persig was talking about, where they're, you know, like once you get past that sort of like gradeless idea, there's, there's an education to be had. But you gotta want it and you gotta work for it. You know? So there's that. Um 
Yeah, Pink, we have definitely uh, been discussing that uh, last week and this week again, where we think that this book is dated at this point. Uh, we're about, what, f- just over 40 years out? Um, no. Yeah. No, wait. Longer. 74, right? Nineteen seventy four. So uh, we're at yeah no f- yeah forty years like forty three or whatever. My math skill. I thought we were in nineteen twenty four for or sorry I thought we were in two thousand twenty four for some reason and it made no sense. Um, Eddie Izzard. Yeah, that's the book about motorcycles that you recommended to us last time, Stitzville, right? Um, I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, can you message Sam the name of that and ask him to remind me to uh, to look at that? Because I do want to check that out. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and, and like I think, I think the one thing I took out of my educational experience is that. Um, For me, like, I don't, I don't, I didn't succeed at it and I went through a lot of hard times, but at the same time, like, it was not, it it didn't, like, jade me to the educational system. I think the educational system is there in place to help a lot of people and a lot of people can learn from that. And you're right, it is very broken and impersonal and that sucks. But at the same time, like, that, that does lend itself well to the majority of people. Um, whereas there are few people like me and Eddie Izzard and all that, where, you know, that, that doesn't work for them. Um, so there's certainly that, uh, so the book's called Eddie Izzard, believe me. Cool. I will, I will put that on my list of things for sure. Yeah, and then Neil Pert has the... Cool. Thank you. We always appreciate book recommendations here on Read Write. Yeah, totally pink. Um, I agree. Um, and, and, and part of it is also things like... Um, I don't actually believe in tests uh at all i think i think tests are uh, a poor way of showing knowledge especially because i'm a person who doesn't necessarily do super well with uh, memorization but i can understand concepts really well so like on tests i never did like i i got okay grades and stuff but i never did particularly great and because of my adhd testing rooms that were completely silent were like the bane of my existence because like every time someone taps something, uh, it was a problem. <laughs> yeah, and and yeah, like double like I agree entirely with that that gradeless classes can be a double edged sword uh, because there are people who will coast by and kind of get a grade and all that. I I think the nice thing about uh, the nice thing about the the system that he was proposing was that it wasn't a gradeless system it's just people didn't know their grades until the final grade was given out so it's like instead of like you would write you would write papers and tests and you wouldn't get a grade back sort of thing so you kind of had to judge yourself um so that for sure uh i remember being in university the first time i had to write a test in university was for an anthropology class that i honestly missed a ton of things for 
Can you hear me now? Yes, we got you oh, back. Oh, sweet Jesus, I'm back. Uh, so I'll just finish my story and then we can we can continue. I've returned. Um. So I was this anthology test, and I I never had to study in high school, not not at all. Um. So there was a a a point there where I went and wrote that test, and I knew nothing. I literally wrote like 15 answers on this like giant sheet and uh i think i got seven percent on that test and like that was my final grade was like seven that's seven percent yeah it's bad it's real bad that's that's a zero preparation kind of yeah result. but like i didn't know how to prepare i didn't know what way like because obviously sitting down and reading the textbook is not the right way for me to prepare i know that now like knowing about yeah, my ADHD not. and the strategies to dealing with that. But at the time I didn't, I just tried to study like everyone else and I failed utterly at it. Um, and well, I, that's one of the hardest. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that's one of the hardest things about school, but especially about post-secondary school is learning how to study Yeah. and learning how to learn. That's uh, yeah. like obviously the first step, but it's so completely important because you can't do anything else without it. Yeah, um, I definitely think that I've spent the last two years uh, really developing my drive, and I think that's kind of shown in the amount of work that I've been producing, especially this year. Um, like, I think in the last month, I've written seven comic books, comic issues, which is more than I wrote in the entirety of the six years I was in school. <laughs> Yeah, school's a stressful time, though. It's hard to, or at least I found it hard to be creative at the same time. Right, but I'm just saying, like, like that sort of, like, I knew I wanted to write. I was writing stuff for the newspaper, and then just, like, the amount of output I've, like, my output is obviously grown, and it should. Um, so there, there's definitely um, a drive that I've gotten that I'm very driven, that I'm working on projects, and that I'm accomplishing projects and moving forward. And the first time I started doing that on stream, like streaming is what helped me do that, by the way. Um, I 100% credit streaming as being a very big part of that. It kept me on a, on, on a schedule. There was people that I was kind of beholden to. Um, like it was dedicated time. And because of that, I was able to make it through that. Uh, but yeah, like... Um, yeah, the sorry, Sisville's talking about the Malcolm Gladwellian ten thousand hours of work on any given topic to become the so called expert. Yeah, I've heard a lot of things about that lately, about how untrue that is. <laughs> but Well, it's highly debatable. He had a lot of statistical data behind what he said. Yeah. So Yeah, well I think I think it's one of those things that his his quote got appropriated by somebody. Oh yeah, it's and been became vastly... kind of a thing. It's been oversimplified and kind of smushed down into this flattened version of what he yeah. originally meant. I should I should read the uh, original. Is probably what I should do to get it's it from Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, th thanks, Erica. I appreciate that um, you think I work really hard. Um, and, and and yeah, Pink. I've kind of become a a comic book writer because I've kind of realized that that's effectively what I'm good at and what I kind of want to do. Not necessarily that I'm getting rid of writing other types of writing, but uh, that I'm very much focused on that for the moment. Yeah, well, you know, not everyone can be a real writer. <laughs> oh, shit. You're right. I can't be a real writer. I, I'm not good at prose, man. I'm just not. Uh, no, that's fine. Not everyone is. In fact, most people are not. Yeah. In fact, maybe no one is. <laughs> I think that's entirely possible. Yeah. And I agree. Uh, I think a few years from now, I'll try and do some other things. I did prose the last couple of years to try and uh, work on prose specifically uh, to, to get my base skills better. And then, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. This kind of turned into a Brendan biography podcast. 
Uh, Jeez, I, I my mic cuts out for like five minutes, and you just go full solipsism. I, I guess, but I mean, in a, in a certain sense, like all of the things that we were discussing are very much relatable to what Persig is proposing in the book, right? Of like the way that we understand the self and the experience that he talks about with education and all that stuff, like that. I I don't know, man. I think I, I kind of reject a lot of what he says. Like I don't. I, I didn't have a great experience in school, and yeah, I reject a lot of authority, but at the same time, I don't think that systematization is to be rejected, and it's not a bad way of analyzing the world. Like, yeah. I don't believe at all that there is some magical force behind anything, whether it be a so-called absolute quality, or it be, you know, the uh, the virtue of some particular moral behavior, or, or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Like, there's only what you make in the world, and there's no intrinsic judgment. Yeah. So, I, like, a lot of what he's saying is just him, as far as I can tell, kind of moralizing to something that I, like, that I, I don't believe for a second even exists. Like, he, he's just gone into this weird, deistic, masturbatory fantasy about how everything that he likes is correct, and everything else is some deviation from the... The, the desired course of action of the universe. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I guess I'm every, I mainly believe everything that he does not believe, which made this especially difficult. Yeah. Well, and, and like, if you, yeah. I, well, yeah, and I rejected everything that wasn't about art or school <laughs> from this book. I was like, I don't know. Even his, even I thought the things like it's far too subjective. He's way too close to the problem to be able to suggest any kind of oh, I just, like large scale solution. I, I like I guess I should, guess I should qualify that statement in saying that it's not that I agreed with his argument or, at all. It's that his argument made me think of something uh, in the way that I experienced it. Right. So so it gave me a new tool to interpret my own stuff. Not that I actually believe anything he says. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. Uh, mm. I just feel like so because of the way he presents these arguments, it's just hard to like because I reject so much of the foundation of it. I, like all the branches of it seem like they should just fall away and disappear into the void. And that's not to say that they aren't. They don't necessarily stand on their own because they aren't necessarily logically connected to the foundation argument that he's making. Mm -hmm. But I just, I don't know. It seems so profoundly incoherent that it's, that the the conclusions that are out at the ends of the branches, I feel like can't be supported if all the previous bits of the argument aren't valid. Zen Buddhism at the core, everything is right and also wrong. That That's, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the solution and the problem. <laughs> 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 yeah for sure for sure sorry i have to do something real quick here a uh, zen buddhist runs up to uh hot dog stand uh, and he says make me one with everything <laughs> sorry uh that that yeah yeah that's the band hammer pun that you just got <laughs> w wicked is a good friend of mine uh and she told me that uh that to make like to make it up to me to ban her in so, in a place where I could, so I did. <laughs> yeah, well, there we go. You flew too <laughs> close to the sun, wicked. I apologize. I did not know that was going to be so long. My bad. <laughs> I don't know how to undo it. <laughs> I don't think you can. Uh, I think I can. Can I? Oh no, I can't. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Rip. Ripping pizza, wicked, 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 wicked. My bad. <laughs> I, I I can't fix it, Erica. I didn't actually ban her. I timed her out, and I don't think you can undo that, unless unless you know a way. If you do, please tell me. Let's all unban at the same time. Whoops. See what happens. Feels bad, man. Mistakes were made. Okay, <laughs> Mistakes were made. 
Hmm, Erica Cotton, would you like to test that out? <laughs> Well, Persig would have a nervous breakdown and send his son home on a bus <laughs> <laughs> at this point, <laughs> I think, as soon as shit got really bad. Sorry, let's, oh, let's make... I meant more, would you like to get timed out for one second, but regardless. Anyway, derailed. Derailment at its finest. Yeah, oh, yeah, we just, like... <laughs> oil all over this small town yeah <laughs> uh so yeah um which is fine i mean we both we both kind of like didn't really enjoy this book yeah uh, and i believe when we were talking about it uh we kind of wanted to discuss what what do we do in a book club where we didn't really enjoy the book Oh, I saw your comment, Erica Cotton. I just, I couldn't interrupt Brendan's rambling and then I had no mic for a while. <laughs> so yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. I posted a picture of my accidental tie pin on uh, on Twitch. Or not on Twitch. We're on Twitch right now. On Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so take a look at that if you want to see it up close. What did you think about the duck killing scene, Sam? Uh, I didn't, I don't think I read that part. The duck killing scene. I thought that was really weird because uh, I, I read that this afternoon uh, I don't think I have a note for it but anyway uh, like he he like grabs this duck by the neck and, and looks it right in the eye and breaks its neck as he's looking it in the eye it's really creepy but at the same time like not really because that's what you do when you're hunting ducks like you intend to eat this thing right so I don't know maybe that's just my perspective yeah, it just it didn't seem as I don't know. It didn't seem like that big a deal, like because I was so checked out by that point. It's so close to the end. Yeah, that it was just like, oh, great. You killed a duck. Cool. Let's go to the next thing. Yeah, but I mean, like looking him in the eye. I mean, we've already determined that he's like he's probably psychotic. Um I don't know. I think he, it was just like this weird, um, like empathy, empathy thing that he was trying to like connect with this animal. And then it was like, Oh, right. But I'm actually here to eat you. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's definitely fucked up. I have so little to say about so much of the stuff at the end because like, it's just, it was so boring. It was so much work to get through. Oh, cool. Good to know. Yeah. Man, I don't know. I don't is there how much more do you even want to say on this? I don't know. So, yeah, let's um Oh, actually I did have one point that I want to point out. Did you notice that every single time they stop at a restaurant, they always have a steak and like these giant milkshakes every time? Man, I wish I could have a milkshake every time I stopped at a rate. How does this guy afford this many steaks? Like, and it's the seventies, right? Well, he's so... a technical writer, like a really good one. Sure, but I'm how sure much he's cash... well paid. How much cash is this man carrying with him? Oh yeah, I guess they don't have ATMs and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't think about that. Oh man, <laughs> like he's got to have hundreds of dollars, I guess, or maybe he's stopping at banks and just never mentioning it. Yeah, we read, we read, uh, Zen and the Order, Art of Motorcycle Racing by Jim per Parsley. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I was actually in Wicked West's chat where I got this recommendation. Wicked owns a bookstore or runs Dude. a bookstore or something. Anyway. There's a bookstore <laughs> and she is a boss person. There's someone associated with books here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, uh, in the 70s, that all you can get at restaurants? Actually, that's probably true. Diners on the road, like, the steak's probably the only thing that's good. That's true. They do talk about that <laughs> one part where they, they go to the diner and the, they get burgers and they're, like, not very good. And they look over and the chef is just kind of eyeballing them, like, 
yeah, I dare you to say something about my hamburgers. <laughs> I dare you. There's another store in a hundred miles. Yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, yeah. It, I don't know. I I tried. Um. So yeah, uh, let's discuss a lot. Like we have about fifteen minutes left. So uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, 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 it's true. Um. Let's discuss uh, finishing books and what we were what we we're going to talk about before of like. Yeah, how do we deal with how do we deal how how do we deal with this? I don't know. I think this has kind of turned out okay in all things considered. Like, as much as it's been a kind of bitch fest about the book, yeah, that's what's maybe that's what it's like. Well, I I think that this book specifically worked out well for that because I don't think the ending was fundamentally different from the beginning in terms of content. Well, no, and he managed to go full circle, which you didn't necessarily get if you didn't get to the end, but. Like, I don't. I don't really need to because I kind of got that he got full circle from the beginning. So like it just, you know. Yeah. Um, like there's so no. Guess, there's not really not really twists in this book, other than that font change because that was ridiculous. The, and and he he actually uses that the those dreams that um, manifest throughout the book uh, that at the end it's revealed they're actually memories of when he was in the hospital. And like he basically disassociated and his family came to visit him and he was in a cell or in a room with a glass door and he refused to open it because he didn't know who they were. Yeah. But the, and now it's him remembering that, not even knowing who he was, you know, so he's like so far away from his own life. Anyway, I don't know. I thought that those they actually were one of the more interesting and concrete symbols that ran through the book from a mm -hmm. personal perspective. Sure. Oh yeah, we we could do um, live reenactments. <laughs> we should we should we should save that for the YouTube channel. We'll just have a reenactments segment. Yeah, they have those like black and white nineteen twenties title cards that come up. That'll be amazing. We should do that. <laughs> All right, stay tuned. Stay tuned everyone, for that, whatever that is. Um, so yeah, did you want to talk about uh, next time? Yeah, we can talk about it next time. Uh, so the next book we're going to be reading is a David Sedaris book. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but I do own it's it. It's called Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. I was just making sure that it's on the screen there uh, by David Sedaris. He's yeah. a funny man. Yeah. So uh, in an effort to kind of improve what how how terrible at reading I was for this experience for this specific book. Uh, I actually was kind of going to propose a, uh, yeah, an experiment where, uh, I, I think I'm going to get the audiobook version of this and yep. see, and we can kind of compare and contrast experiences. I've listened to the audiobook of this a long okay. time ago, but you know, like 10 years ago, probably. Uh, and yeah, he, honestly, the Sedaris books are amazing in audiobook because he reads them himself. Yeah. Uh, and you get it, so much more out of it. Yeah, and I and I kind of feel like, um, oh yeah, the jam jars. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, I I kind of feel like I I, I need that that break, uh, and, and it well, should this also is short. Yeah, and it'll also give me a more concrete idea of how many hours it'll take and stuff, and I should be able to do it. So <laughs> yeah, actually, you saying that I'm I'm about to look it up, uh, see how long that book is. Family Corduroy Denim. It is. Oh yeah, you'll. This is like a one sitting. It's six hours and eighteen minutes. Perfect. That's exactly what I need right now. Yeah, it's super short. Yeah. Well, and to be fair, the book itself, I think, is only like two hundred pages. Yeah. Two hundred and fifty pages. Yeah. Nice. So we're doing. So, are we doing two episodes or one? Did we're we gonna just, do two. We're gonna do well, two. Well, because it's a uh, it's a collection of like essays, right? So oh I right, yeah. So we're gonna need extra time. That's fine. And the way that he writes it, it's uh, it, they're pretty dense. Like, there's a lot going on there. So you'll see when you get into it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, does Reese Witherspoon do it? Uh, I think that's oh. Ghost Set of Watchmen is Reese Witherspoon. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, I didn't. No, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, I swear David Sedaris read this shit. 
<laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I will say that uh, Wicked was talking about books the other day. Um, and uh, I think we should read uh, Satan, His Psychotherapy and, and in Cure by the unfortunate Dr. Kasler, JSPS. What? When was this book released? 1982. It's real long, though. How many pages is this book? 500. That's a that's a little long. Are you going to be able to handle that? I hope so. I don't feel like I can have a problem with that, but uh <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay with trips. I'm okay with weird philosophy. Um I have no problems with that stuff. I just uh I found the longer I go, uh, the less I care about book, like finishing books that aren't interesting. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. I can't like, um, I can't resist finishing a book. If I start it, I have to finish it. It's like not possible. Yeah. And I feel bad because I, I don't like being that person. Too late. You are that person. Yeah, you live that life. Also, your mom has misspelled my name every single time. <laughs> this entire street. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's not on me to correct people. Yeah, uh, that's fine. <laughs> I ain't no spelling boy. Yeah. Uh, but I actually think we should do the Eddie Izzard book at some point too. Which one? Because he has multi- the newest one. Uh, believe me. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's certainly uh, an option. Um, I know I've suggested also something like red dragon just because i've been watching hannibal again recently and i never read those books yeah i thought that would be interesting um all, oh and something that was kind of tangentially connected to um a book i reread as in preparation for a youtube project that i'm going to be working on soon um nice. that was about um uh, that, that referred to in the book, anyway, there's this thing called Gogol's, and it's in reference to an author whose name was Gogol, uh, and it, uh, who wrote a book called Dead Souls. It's all about the way the the weird bureaucracy of serfdom in uh, 1850s Russia. So, like, this con artist comes to town and starts trying to buy up the licenses to dead serfs off uh, nobles' tax records, so that they don't have to pay the tax for them. Because he's gonna like it's like a 2008 financial crisis thing like he's trying to merge these mortgages into these packages and sell them off again but with actual people's lives <laughs> that's the best way to spell that for sure <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. uh brief segments of classic short stories um yeah we could do something like that i'm we're, we're still playing around with this format a little bit we're learning like what works and what doesn't uh i think the last two or two no, I think most of the books we've done so far have been pretty good. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw that I hate children and it's the epitome of kids being annoying. Lord of the Flies, man. I yeah, did not that... like that book. Um, I only appreciated that book because it's a very good study of... Um, oh, what's that comparison term that everyone uses to describe it? I don't even know what <sighs> term do they use. It's like uh it's like when you're using a small example as uh Oh, it's a microcosm. Yeah. Is that what I'm... Or a, syne- a synecdoche. I mean, I guess it depends on whether you're talking about the literary device or like a microcosm is a smaller version of the whole thing. Yeah, no, no, no. There I'm talking about the literary device in which you're using a microcosm to describe the larger world. Uh that's yeah, that's a synecdoche where you look at one part and and it reflects the whole yeah as opposed to metonymy which is the opposite where you take a big thing and make it small i don't think that's the term i'm thinking of though i want is there a more colloquial word for that probably i don't know um because I know, I know there's a, I know there's a, a, a term. Anyway, that was the only reason Lord of the Flies was interesting. Lord of the Flies as a book is friggin' stupid, and I hate it. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my favorite book. 
I also yeah. think I read it in like grade nine, so that that has biased me against it because almost anything I read in school uh, I like less. Really? Because um, there's a lot of stuff I read in school that I actually really enjoyed. Well, there were things I read that I enjoyed, but like, I feel like being compelled to read something is makes yeah. it less fun. It is 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 that why this isn't as fun for me? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I, I've really, I've actually really enjoyed the books that we've read so far. Uh, this is the only one, and you know what? I don't even hate it. It's just, it's just so boring. Um, and wicked. <laughs> if it, I, I'm super psyched that you're pumped about it, um, I mean, maybe sometime down the road, if you've got suggestions for books, uh, uh, wicked has tons of suggestions for books. I'm just putting it out there. Wicked has read every single uh, Wizard of Oz book. Isn't there only like three? No, there's like 25. Prove me wrong, Wicked. Debate me on Skype. Lord of the Fliesing It. That's terrible. That That individual should be banned from English. <laughs> all right yeah um so oh uh, yeah i actually kind of wanted to uh in connection to our next book i wanted to offer as a teaser a um one uh, like a tiny version of one of his anecdotes okay uh, so sedaris is like often described as a humorist and it's true that almost everything that he writes is hilarious but at the same time, most of it's really dark and or has an interesting twist to it or like kind of a, a dark twist usually. So uh, this particular book, Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim, uh, has a lot of the essays that are written just after 2001. So there's a lot of increased security at airports and stuff that was new at the time. Uh, and David Sedaris was flying somewhere. and I don't remember where it was probably between uh, uh, France and the US because he was living in France at the time. Um, so he was he was waiting in line uh, at customs, and the woman in front of him was uh, had a nursing like infant, and she had two bottles of breast milk with her. And at the time, you know, there was that all that concern about being able to carry fluids and stuff onto planes. And so the security team forced her to open one and taste it to make sure that it wasn't poisonous or, or dangerous or something. And Sedaris's conclusion was. And this is why sperm donors all take Greyhound now. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's more or less the flavor of his comedy. Yeah. Uh, so to speak. So yeah, that's going to be really fun. I think and, what I was trying to, the word I was trying to remember was allegory. Oh, that's not the same thing. No. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted your flow there. <laughs> uh, Chat's freaking out though. Yeah, no, Chad's freaking out. Um, so, yeah, so next um, next episode is going to be August the 7th? Uh, yeah. August 7th, we're going to have our our guest Mike next time, hopefully, yeah. assuming that all schedules remain open. Do we, if it's so short, do we need the three weeks? Or do you just want to keep doing the three weeks? I, I kind of want to just keep the schedule because I... Okay. Also, I told him that he had that amount of time. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I don't want to scrape back time that I promised. That That's fine. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be August 7th then. We'll be doing the next one. And I promise, I promise that I will get it done. <laughs> this one's a much more appealing book. So I don't think that's going to be a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like six for nine, I think. <laughs> Yeah, you're not doing super well. Well, two of them, to, to be fair, two of them were this book. And one of them I was only off by a short story. So. 
but yeah. Will it still be raining? Very likely. <laughs> it's raining forever. There's no day that it doesn't rain. It's now Waterworld. It's only rain. Oh, man. Sweet. When do I get the gills? <laughs> I haven't actually seen Waterworld, so I don't know what you're talking about. But... Oh, Jesus Christ. You don't get to make a Waterworld <laughs> joke and then not have watched it. What is? It was a good joke, though. And then you ruined it. All right. Well, on that note, yeah. stream, I think we're done. Yeah, we made we made our ninety minutes. Don't say that now. You've said it. Why just say it out loud? <laughs> it was so subtle. Um, yeah, we're we've met our quota, everybody. See you later. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. Jeez, Louise. Yeah. Uh, so, if you want to see more of this stuff that we're talking about here, uh, you can check us out at rewrite.podbean.com, uh, where we have all of the uh audio versions of the podcast as well as our sister podcast input output which is basically just me and sam shooting the shit uh just to, just to mix it up give us less of a, a formalized structure um, yeah so if you like like this then uh me uh slamming boondangle uh <laughs> talking <laughs> that's that's great <laughs> I've seen Blade Runner. I've actually studied. I've read the script for Blade Runner too. We had to watch it in class. I've seen it like multiple times, actually. <laughs> I should re. I really want um, a side note, and then we'll kind of finish closing up. Uh, on a side note, I really want to sit down with the script of Blade Runner and and really study that movie. Uh, and I'm probably gonna do it shortly before the new one comes out. So. You guys are great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, what else we got? We got to do uh, media. Oh, geez. Um, I don't even know. I've been working so much on this stupid book uh, and also building up a pile of other books that I have to read. I'm super far behind on, like, everything. Uh, <laughs> I feel you, bro. It's been a, it's been I, a busy couple of weeks. Uh, I don't know. I've been... I, I reread... The Quantum Thief by Hanu Ryanimi recently. It's a really oh, good book. I haven't read that, but I do know it. It's super good. Okay. Uh, it's going to be part of the basis. It, it's it's part of the, the test for the YouTube thing that I want to do. Oh, I was just writing, yeah. Writing uh, up a, a really bizarre uh, summary of it today that I thought was interesting. Are you ready to announce that secret project, or uh, do you want to wait till next episode? Uh, geez, I don't know if I want to talk about that secret project so much yet. That okay. secret project is a pretty secret right now. Right. So uh, we will we will come back to that next time. Yes, we will talk about that secret project next time. Yes, that secret project. Uh, so media, yeah. Uh, Quantum Thief. That's your that's your choice. Quantum okay. Thief. Yep. Um, actually, if you go back and look at my Twitter feed, that is the notes underneath my my. Uh, picture that I took the other day so you can get a little teaser nice look for, look for hints and all the secrets that I'm dropping in my extremely sparse <laughs> Twitter feed yeah uh, I actually have too many things to recommend this week because I went to Montreal Comic Con and have been spending like umpteen hours with professional comic book people who just give me recommendation after recommendation so I literally bought like like hundreds of dollars in comic books in the last couple of weeks not hundreds a hundred um to to further my comic book education uh but i think the thing that i'm going to recommend is something that just came out on netflix recently uh netflix original called little witch academia which is the new tv series version of two sh uh two um short films that they uh that this japanese animation company put out uh, they actually, it's fascinating because it's one of the only animes that's ever been kickstarted. Wait, really? Yeah. I would have figured that'd be a big thing. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's it, like they, they funded the movies by Kickstarter and mm -hmm. Netflix, uh, put out a call to get the actual like TV show version. So, uh, I'm watching the TV show version now. It's not, it loses a little bit of the charm of the, uh, of the short films uh they're like 
30 to 45 minutes each so they're not feature length okay but you can do a lot with that yeah yeah, no they're very good um so the show is very good as well it's just it's got a little bit of a different tone uh which i'm a little sad about but i'm not that sad about because it's still really good so is it is it a animated or is it a live action thing it's version okay good Yeah, yeah okay Cause I, you know, they're all into like making live action versions of everything anime. Now. <laughs> yeah. Like, so no, made... uh, it's pretty good. Um, it's, it's like, it's, it's one of those, like, it seems really cutesy and silly, but at the same time has a lot of really good character depth. Uh, and the plots are intriguing in weird ways. Cause they're kind of like magical hijinks, but they're not like the magical hijinks you kind of expect. And then it like all of the characters are um, are t- like it it takes place in like a witch high school, so there's really not that many boys or anything like that around. Witch uh, high school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who's, who's on first? <laughs> what's on second? Oh jeez. Oh jeez, Rick. Ah <laughs> oh, jeez, Rick. These jokes are pretty bad. <laughs> so. Uh, it, it, you'd expect it to be filled with weird teenage drama, and it's not. Uh, anyway, it's just a really good show. It's well written. What, what kind uh, of anime isn't filled with teenage drama? I don't get it. Yeah, uh, it's it's extremely well animated too. All right, I'm flipping the table. No teenage drama. I'm out. <laughs> we should read a teenage drama at some point. Oh yeah, we need to read some like really teen visual novel. Okay, I'm down. Actually, uh, uh, well, we got to find one that's short though. That's the thing. Okay, um, I because because pl- those actually, tend to be hundreds here, of hours. Let me plug something else that actually I can plug. Uh, Slow Beef on YouTube uh, and his visual novel book club are currently reading a visual novel called Hustle Cat. Okay, that involves a cat bar in Tokyo where all the employees are actually or magically turn into cats. Nice. Um, it's completely ridiculous, uh, and I've definitely been listening slash watching it. It's basically a podcast, but it, they have pictures sometimes so maybe that's something we could take a look at yeah because i think that would be interesting to play or you know any of the hate analog story things although uh, like i've kind of already read that because i watched that on the first season of visual novel book club yeah uh i think i think doing a visual novel or like some sort of interactive fiction would actually be a, a, an interesting thing to do Ooh. yeah actually if we're gonna do that because i i have um read only memories do you have that have you played that no but it's kind of a visual novel. I do own kind a ton of, of visual novels, though. <laughs> it, it's kind of like a point-and-click adventure. It would be interesting to do as a, a non-standard format. Wait, like a you know what we should do? What? We should do To Be or Not To Be. Oh, shit, yes, for sure. I started playing yeah. it the other day. Oh, my God. It, I, I haven't got past the credits. I spent 30, 35 minutes playing that game. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just fantastic. <laughs> Like just everything is an option, and even the dumb options. Oh my God! He thanked the Big Bang. (laughs) What? (laughs) Thanks, like thanks to the Big Bang for creating the universe. Yeah, it like it's like this whole thing where if you keep clicking on the more thanks, he basically goes on this whole thing where he keeps jumping back in time and thanks different Uh, moments in time as it goes, and it's fantastic. So to everyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, this is uh, or this was originally a printed a choose your own adventure or as uh, as the author Ryan North was compelled to call it a select your own path because choose your own adventure is copyrighted. <laughs> um, so it's a select your own path novel that's about Hamlet or, or not about Hamlet. It is Hamlet, but you get to take on the role of one or several, actually, depending on your path yeah. of the characters in that. Uh, up to and including Hamlet himself or Ophelia or yeah. Hamlet Sr. So you basically start dead and you immediately lose the game. I, I was I clicked <laughs> on that one first because I kind of figured that was what was going to happen and I really wanted to see it. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but essentially you yeah. just are instantly I, killed because I, prior I to the it. events of the book, <laughs> I knew it. Play, you're dead. <laughs> so it's, it's fantastic and Ryan North is hilarious. Uh, he writes dinosaur comics. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It's the comic in which the picture never changes, and every day it is visually identical except for the text, and it's hilarious every time. Yeah, and he's been doing a lot of. He's been doing some like real like I don't want to say real. He's been doing uh, like some Rick and Morty or something. Like he's been writing for some pro comic companies yep. doing he, bigger books. Yeah, 
he does comic books he, writing for a bunch of different comic books um the the midas curse i think was one of his big ones mm -hmm. a couple years ago um he's done uh he did this to be or not to be which is a, which was originally a book and now is a game and he did the one that was the same for romeo and or juliet uh, again the same thing you see you know it's a choose your own path thing um yeah he's been in all sorts of bigger projects plus of course the comic that he's been doing for like 15 20 years yep dinosaur comics is pretty great dinosaur comics is amazing quants.com yeah i think it's dot com dot ca i don't know anyway you can find it you'll find it it's eminently googleable <laughs> it's pretty easy to find so I think that's us for this week. Yeah, that that's just about everything. So uh, give us your shout-out Twitter handle, and uh, we'll close this bad boy up. Yeah, so uh, if you want to find my shit, uh, take a look at my Twitter stuff at MC Pepper Pockets uh, or at barrel at seed.com, although that's been pretty inert for most of the summer. I've note, been otherwise note, note to self, make a command for this shit. <laughs> yeah, so we can spew this out into the chat. It doesn't matter. We can say it too. Yeah. Well, no. So, so we have the chat links while we're saying it. Is my please point. like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, good evening, Bling Blong. You're awesome, Sissel. I like I like your jokes. Uh, so oh. you guys can find me at Freak Lab Mishap on Twitter, uh, here on Accidental Origin uh, on Twitch. And uh, on my website, axelorangin.com. I was like, I'm forgetting something. So, yeah. Give me your link. Yeah, go take a look. I got a bunch of dumb crap on there. There's a really None cool of picture of a freaky ass astronaut on there. Oh, yeah, there's a spooky astronaut. I should just, uh, if you take a look at. Uh, Uh, at this on <laughs> it's at oh, mc it? pepper pockets there we go yeah sorry i was trying to put it in and it wouldn't let me because it kept trying to autofill it to someone else's name <laughs> so there it is um yeah gg gg okay that's it we're done <laughs> we're out Thank done. thanks for hanging out guys we really appreciate it uh this was a pretty good discussion actually um and that always makes it easier so thank you uh i think i speak for sam as well i'm th speaking for sam whether he likes it or not goodbye everyone goodbye. see you in uh three weeks except for me which you will see next sunday <laughs> Jesus. All whatever right. man see you later guys <laughs> bye <laughs> PUBG.